Good evening. We are in our Bible class booklet, a Bible survey on page 24, lesson, lesson 12. Solomon builds the temple. It's covering uh, 1 Kings chapter 6 is where we're going to begin this evening in our class. Uh, I made a little line on there. Um, that section that we're supposed to begin on. Solomon's Temple. Does everyone have a book? All right, good. So to this point, you know, we've been studying through here in First Kings uh, with the end of David's reign and uh, with, with Solomon taking the helm, taking the, the throne. And uh, some of the chaos and politics that went with all of that, with other the brothers and different ones. We've got Solomon getting established in his reign and then preparing things for the temples, what we've kind of been talking about in this lesson, this lesson number 12 here so far, working with Hiram of Tyre and, and getting the, the trees from that area in order to have lumber to build that. And then we most recently talked about Solomon's task force, so so some of the the labor from uh, foreign foreign people, but it seems like there's also even people within the nation of Israel that were enlisted or drafted, I think was the word we used. And so that perhaps brought some discontent uh, with being kind of forced to do all that. But that's how he's getting things done. So that's where we, we end up here in uh, this section for Solomon's temple being built. And so let's read just from our Bibles, um, and, I've, and I'm trying to do something a little different here. Uh, be able to, you can follow along in your Bible or on the screen. I'm looking at the English Standard Version. I just want to read the first 10 verses, and then we'll look at the first question there. So it says in uh, 1 Kings 6, 1, In the 480th year after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. The house that Solomon built for the Lord was 60 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. The vestibule in front of the nave of the house was 20 cubits long, equal to the width of the house, and 10 cubits deep in front of the house. And he made for the house windows recessed frames with recessed frames. He also built a structure against the wall of the house, running around the walls of the house, both the nave and the inner sanctuary, and he made side chambers all around. The lowest story was five cubits broad, the middle one was six cubits broad, and the third was seven cubits broad. For around the outside of the house he made offsets on the wall in order that the supporting beams should not be inserted into the walls of the house. When the house was built, it was with stone prepared at the quarry, so that neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron was heard in the house while it was being built. The entrance for the lowest story was on the south side of the house and one went up by stairs to the middle story, and from the middle story to the third. So he built the house and finished it, and he made the ceiling of the house of beams and planks of cedar. He built the structure against the whole house, five cubits high, and it was joined to the house with timbers of cedar. So the question is, in what year did he build it? So that's really back in verse 1. In what year did Solomon start construction of the temple? It was 480 years after they uh, got out of the wilderness. After the Exodus? Yeah. So that's that's interesting that, you know, how do we base our calendar? Base, uh, what's, this, what's year one in our calendar today? It's after Christ. Christ. It's, it's, it's supposed to be... Yeah, it's an Odomini in the year of our Lord, and that's supposed to match his birth, although there's some problems a few years off or something, but that's the idea. That's that's how our calendar works. But what they're basing it on, of course, that didn't happen yet, right? And this is back in time. 
they're basing it on that pivotal moment of their salvation being released from ex from the Egyptians, right? I thought that was kind of interesting because uh, it's you know they aren't you're using our dates, right? They're just saying relative to this event is when that came out, and I think some. The Septuagint says 440 years, and this says 480 years. There's some questions about that. It's interesting that it's 40 times, I want to get this wrong, 40 times 12. <laughs> so so uh, 40 is kind of a, a generation, and 12, of course, is one of those numbers, 12 tribes and all those things. Uh, it, may, it may be sort of a round number to make that point as well. But if, anyway, around 500. Yeah, that's right. Also, the fourth year of Solomon's reign is another way to, to gauge it. And that, that makes more sense. Maybe uh, another way that's commonly things are dated in the, the reign of a, a king. Are there other thoughts on that particular question? I had some images I wanted to show. Um, some of the things about the temple there. There's more details we'll, we'll read about or maybe we'll skip over. But this is just a likeness of some of the things we read about. In the temple there. Uh, we didn't get into all the d details, but hopefully in your study you read about the the sea and the altar and the other uh, water carts, I guess. There's like five on each side. So there's ten of those. Those kinds of things. But there's more details, of course, in the text about that. It's hard to, hard to imagine some of the things uh, like the word nave, and at least in the English Standard Version I was reading, it talked about the nave. I think in the architecture of this facility here, this would be the nave, this open, this sort of the auditorium. So like uh, the main the main open area of the building. So we might say the holy place, and then the holiest places in the back, the way it's structured. All right. Let's read a few more verses for the next question. Let's look at verse 11. Verses 11 through 13. Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon. Concerning this house that you are building, if you will walk in my statutes and obey my rules and keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will establish my word with you, which I spoke to David your father. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people, Israel. So the question, what promise did God give during the temple's construction? He would not abandon or forsake Israel if uh, Solomon obeyed what God instructed. Yeah, there's an if in there, right? If, if, if you obey and walk in the law of the Lord, then he'll... Uh, He'll establish his word and, and uh, dwell among the people, dwell among the children of Israel, and not forsake them. Of course, that's part of the idea of the temple, right, is that there's a sense in which God's dwelling there. Not that, not that of course, as we read through, Solomon himself points out he can't be contained in some box or whatever, but there's a sense in which he's portraying that. I just have to think uh, <clears throat> there didn't need to be a cloud or a pillar over top because people all knew that. Welfare. Well, right, but when it starts out, there is a, a, a rushing of some sort of cloud that's depicted, right? But but not all the time, like all like in time. like talking about the tabernacle where that would be over there, and, the and then it would move, and they know it was time to move, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. Um, Solomon was the last king of Israel, right? Yes. He set the example that we must follow God and keep all of his ways because if Solomon fell, you know, fell down in his duty to do this, then that would affect the people. That's right. As the king, he's setting the tone for the nation. And that can, we can even see that in our culture today, maybe the president or different, even celebrities, different people that people look up to things they do are become repeated by other people. And so people with a, a bully pulpit or a uh, large stage, however you would say that, have a, a responsibility to be a good example. And of course, we see problems jumping ahead, right? Solomon uh, 
while he has some great attributes, there's some problems later on. He doesn't quite live up to all of that. All right. Anything else on number 10? Just a, it's not anything new. God is always making this promise if we will follow him. I mean, he started out with him doing that years before, and here he's, he's making that same promise again. So yeah, it's, it's this isn't a new idea. It's, it's, it's him saying the same thing again. And the expectation to follow his law isn't new, and, and, and the expectation that he will uh, fulfill good things for that. Right? He always puts a condition, and if, if right. you do this, if you do that. Mm -hmm. Certainly here. Yeah. Sometimes we like to make greeting cards out of verses and pulling things out of context and missing the, the fuller, the fuller uh, meaning of what's going on. All right. Number 11, let's see here. Let's look at verses, jump down to verse 37. In the fourth year of the foundation of the house of the Lord, in the fourth year the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in the month of Ziv. And in the eleventh year, in the month of Bul, which is the eighth month, the house was finished in all its parts, and according to all its specifications. He was seven years in building it. So the question asks us pointedly, how many years did it take to complete the temple? It's pretty easy when we read that. <laughs> seven. Seven. Some of these months, I, you know, uh, of course, these there are Hebrew words for the months, but I think some of these months are actually Canaanite uh, months. They're not the months we normally think about for the Jewish people, but I'm not sure of the significance of that. That's always can be a little confusing. All right, other thoughts there? Yes, Kim. Wasn't the number seven important to the people that it meant that it was complete and full, rather uh, compared to number six, which was mm -hmm. not not fully complete, incomplete, and not perfect. Right, that's an important number, and it's probably no coincidence that that's the the number here. But uh, Rick. You'll notice it's seven, it's seven years, but, and then they're doing something that we do a lot of times. Like I'll say me and my brothers and my siblings, we're all like three years apart. But actually there's a little difference. It's like it's actually seven years and six months. Uh-huh. And You round up to eight. And, you know, and, we, and like with us, we just like, some of them are at like two years and ten months, and it's, we say that's still three yeah. years, and another one's a little over three years. And that's kind of what they do here. They say seven years, but really it was seven years and about. Mm -hmm. so, months, I don't know how long that is. And, and that could be a cultural thing too. We're like, well, that's not right. <laughs> well, it's that's, just, that's, that's different. What I mean, it's not yeah. incorrect. It's just it's not incorrect. We do that ourselves. Yeah, you know? yeah. But depending on where someone's coming from, that could really trip someone up. Well, that's not exactly precisely what it is mathematically. Well, it's it's roughly that, and that's sometimes they do those numbers to make a point. And I think Kim might be onto something that seven years, of course, is one of those uh, imp important biblical numbers for indicating completeness. And so it was complete in seven years. And it probably took seven years, and it literally too, but I mean, that's uh, interesting. All right. Other thoughts on that one? Or shall we look at the next one here? Let's look at chapter 7 now, next couple verses. Chapter 7. It says Solomon was building his own house 13 years, and he finished his entire house. He built the house of the forest of Lebanon. Its length was 100 cubits, and its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. And it was built on four rows of cedar pillars with cedar beams on the pillars. So our question asks us, what did Solomon build after the temple was done? Making these easy. <laughs> his own house, or his, what do I say, his palace, right? It's, just, it's, that, it's interesting, it's the same word, uh, and even here it's uh, lit, rendered house, right? The house of the Lord and Solomon's house, but we might say the temple would be what would the word we'd use for God's house in, that, in the context here. 
and a king's house, we'd say a palace. So why does he call it the forest of Lebanon? Isn't that like a forest or something? That's where he got the wood from, right? But I think uh, partly it's the, the source, but I think it's also the idea, uh, like if we read the next verse there, it was covered with cedar above uh, the chambers that were on the 45 pillars, 15 in each row. And it seems like these pillars are, are you know, they're, they're trees. They're these wooden pillars from the cedars of Lebanon. And so, so many pillars in there, perhaps it was like a forest, seems to be the idea. At least that's how I kind of took it. This reminds me a lot of my house. Yeah. You've got a lot of trees. <laughs> <laughs> or you're used to. <laughs> and I found a little a, a depiction of that. Um, you know. This is house in front of this. This is house. some artist rendering of uh, att attempting okay. to capture that with the pillars there. Uh, and then there's a mention of the lions along his uh, uh, throne. I believe there's a passage about that. And then all the animals, there's some peacocks on the side, you know. There's talk in the scriptures about that. So. This is supposed to be depicting the uh, Queen of Sheba coming to visit him, which of course, I think we already had that, right? So I don't know <laughs> if some of these are out of order or if this is an anachronism or what. But. I wondered about uh, why it took so long to build his house when it did the temple because, you know, he's a man living there, but he's not there by himself. And so that's why it had to be bigger because of all the concubines and all the wives and all the servants. I don't think there was enough room in the palace. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why it had to be well, so big. Well, of course, wasn't there a mention of, uh, I think, our, our book kind of doesn't ask questions about it. But isn't this the passage where it talks about a separate house also for Pharaoh's daughter? Chapter 7, verse 8. Yeah, talks about that. Um, so at least, of course, we know he ultimately had many wives, but at this point, uh, yeah, chapter 7, verse 8, his own house, uh, his own house where he was to dwell in the other court back of the hall was like, was of like workmanship. Solomon also made a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken in marriage. So it sounds like it's maybe constructed, maybe with the pillars, you know, a lot of the similar types of things. So they weren't all of his wives necessarily in his, in his house. Uh, but, you know, a king's court, right, where all the people would come for the judgments and these sorts of things, and receive, as, as is depicted in the in this, now maybe this is not the order where Sheba, the Queen of Sheba had maybe had already come or whatever, but he would have received dignitaries and that sort of thing at his like residence. They've uh, they forgotten where they came from. <laughs> Having the Pharaoh's daughter there, it's like they got away from Pharaoh, and here they're accepting her. Yeah, you make a good point. That the, there's a lot of times that uh, even even in the wilderness, they're like, we want to go back to Egypt because we had good things to eat. Real life, forgetting that they were slaves and they'd been released from that. But yeah, I think that's a theme that comes up again and again, where pe people look back to those things. And if we have a sin we struggle with and we overcome it, but we fall back into it, isn't that the same kind of thing that can happen today? All right. So he went to build his own house, and we talked about how many years it took to complete it there. Thirteen. Thirteen. So that's an unlucky number, right? <laughs> I don't think that's a biblical thing. For that, that's a more of a modern tradition. Um, it's interesting. It took longer for him to build his house. Of course, it was larger. Uh, some have made the point, well, maybe that shows his priorities. Maybe he should have spent more time on God's things and less on his own uh, material things. I don't know. Big picture, that seems to ring true, but I don't know that that's really a point we could make here. It's a larger building. Okay. So the next section there. 
The Ark of the Covenant is brought into the temple. Let's look at chapter 8 now. And it's asking us here, on what occasion was the Ark brought into the temple and the temple dedicated? So in verse 2, it mentions the feast in the month of Ethanim is what mine says. But yeah, I, I think it's the feast of booths or Sukkot. Yeah, yep. Booths or tabernacle or Sukkoth or Sukkot is, is what fits there. Because, yeah, you go back to Leviticus, I think, is that where it kind of makes all that clear? Yeah. It does make that more clear if you go back there. Yeah. Oops. Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and for seven days, is the Feast of Booths to the Lord, or Tabernacle. So he called everyone together and dedicated the temple at that time. All right, our next page here, we continue that. Looking at, I think at verses 4 through 8 here. Um, question asks us, where was the ark specifically placed? And describe the arrangement of things in the most holy place. So looking at verses 4. Four through eight, I'd suggest. Where was the ark placed? Well, no, is it in the inner sanctuary, right? Yeah. But they say specifically. <laughs> I don't know what else they want. The other specific thing I can say is they had the two cherubim with the wings overshadowed. Yeah. And that's what I reached for too with that uh, so certainly so it was it was in the temple there's the holy place and the most holy place it was in the most holy place or the inner sanctuary and then it was under the the wings of the cherubim that were in there okay so was that the mercy seat where yes. the wings were that's the mercy seat so so until today i would have agreed with that but as i've studied this i think i think the Ark of the Covenant that we read about from the tabernacle has, it's, it's a box, right? It's what Ark is, it's a box. And then there's this, the lid with the mercy seat and the angels, with the wings on it. But I'm pretty sure as I read this, they brought that box in with the lid in, and then he, he installed some other big cherubim. On, oh, on top of that. Those are statues. That's yeah, true. statues. So and I even have a picture. The mercy seat was still under them. I mean, right. The so the mercy seat's kind of lid, part of the ark, sort of. But, but, but the, yeah. The, yeah, the cherubim were still big and up overshadowing. Let's see. I had some other. Um, so this this diagram I could kind of drill in here. Uh, this is supposed to depict. On the on the right is the holy place, and then the left is the most holy place, and so they're trying to show over here. These two, can I get any closer here? Yeah, now again, again, this is a drawing, but it's trying to depict these things we've read in our study. So the, 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 the ark, the ark is in there in the middle in that most holy place, which is a cubical room, it's the same dimensions, every direction. And then on top of that, there's the angels on the mercy seat on the lid. But then it seems like Solomon installed these two statues, whether they look like lions, like they're drawn there. Some things cherubim of some kind with wings. And there's debates on how, what they would look like, but then the ark is under those wings. Kim? Yes, uh, the cherubim or, or the curtains, weren't they put in with the cherubim? And they put that in the curtain? So, Somewhere. so there is a reference. I didn't mark this down, but as I read through this, there's a talk of the tent of meeting. Maybe someone's got a note of that. Um, they brought the, the tent of meeting. They refer to that. Well, the tent of meeting is the tabernacle. Right, but some sometimes it's talked about as maybe the holy of holies part. 
inside. Because there was a tent of meeting before they set up the tabernacle where where um, Moses would meet with God. And so it gets a little confusing where maybe that got put inside the tabernacle and then maybe that got taken and put into the Holy of Holies. That's not clear. That's a side issue. But um, I don't know if that's what you were asking, Kim. What were you asking? <laughs> Right. You know, I had that in my head that they did, but I, as I was studying this, I didn't find the verse that said that. But the cherubim are there, in this in the form of these statues. And of course, one of the reasons we talk about that is because they're sort of all of these motifs, the flowers and the palm trees and all of this garden motif, these plants. A lot of people make the point that it's like the Garden of Eden. And of course, you think about the Garden of Eden, and that's where God met with the people, the people, Adam and Eve, right? And then there was a rift, and then they were sent out because of their sin, and the angels guarded the the east side, right? So then, and then in the temple, now you come in from the east side, and then you're approaching these cherubim. So it seems like there's a connection there. Am I looking at this as in between those two objects? That is a um, the ark, and there's two angels facing each other. This is supposed to be the ark, like we've always seen. And th these are added characters, right? Yeah, I think I think Solomon, as I've read it, Solomon introduced these additional cherubim figures into the holy of holies of the temple that I don't think were present in the like in the um, tabernacle version. They look like sheep. Well, yeah, again, that's just an artist's depiction. I don't think we can be too dogmatic about it. I think they're supposed to look like lions in this particular depiction. Oh, yeah. But, because there's like a mane. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, there's, the scripture doesn't say that. Some have, you know, some of the descriptions of the seraphim with the four heads and the six wings, some have suggested, well, maybe that's what it was like. We just, we aren't told. Kim? Thank you. Yep. Of course, that's the context of the tabernacle. Right. And a lot of those things obviously translate to the temple. Um, but I didn't read about in this account about the curtain. It was more like a four four sided door, like a, almost like a folding door. But of course, we read with uh, Jesus in his crucifixion and death, the temple, the, the veil was torn at that time. But of course, that's the third temple, or the second, the second temple, sorry. <laughs> it gets confusing. This is the original temple that Solomon built. But then, of course, when they went into captivity, that was destroyed. And then under Zerubbabel, they, they built the second temple. And then, Herod kind of rebuilt, he made it bigger. So Herod's temple, you could almost argue, is a third temple. So whatever happened there, there was a curtain. And maybe there's a curtain here as well. All right. So the arrangement of things in the most holy place, I guess we talked about that too, right? Even with our drawing. Uh, it's just those three things in there. Uh, sometimes the, the altar of incense is talked about as being in there. I think Hebrews mentions that, and some suggest that, well, that could be perhaps that it's because the smoke goes in there, the incense smoke. There's also a mention of these poles of the ark extending out and being seen within the holy place. And I've seen one drawing that shows really long poles that kind of has them stick out. Uh, Rick? They have to be. Yeah. Off topic, but they, they would have to be pretty long. They were crazy long. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we found, um, let's see, it was 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verses 14, where the veil is made again of blue, purple, and crimson yarn, and fine linen with cherubim. Okay. Linen. What was that verse again? Uh, Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 14. He made the, the veil of blue and purple and crimson fabrics. Now, is this. 
talking about. This is a this is about the temple, I believe. Solomon builds a temple. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. So definitely, there's a there's a partition of some kind. And this indicates that there's this curtain, veil, very similar to what we read about in the tabernacle. All right. Okay, so 15 asks us, what is obviously the most important part of the temple? What? The inner sanctuary. Why is that the most important part? Yeah, that that seems to be the idea. That, uh... I thought that was a trick question. I thought they <laughs> wanted you to say the ark, but it's uh, a squat mm -hmm. part of the temple. See, the ark yeah. is just residing in. The it's temple. an object within the temple. And where is the ark? I mean, it's the same answer, right? The ark is in. Yeah, it's the in holy the of holies, holies the inner sanctuary, the so holiest I place. To trick us there. Yeah. And, it, and that's an interesting thing. Holy of holies, that's one of those constructions. Lord of lords, king of kings and lord of lords. Song of songs, right? When the, when the Hebrew words do that, it's just saying the superlative. The most best one of that thing, right? So the holiest place. All right. All right, so this is a fun one. What, what, uh, what was in the ark? And Robert, buddy, the Well, depending on where you're reading, right? I was thinking it was, had the uh, uh, manna. Right here in our context, it says there was nothing in the ark, nothing except the two tablets. But but you you are right. There are other passages that indicate other things. Yeah. So what asked them? Were they taken out when they were in captivity? I don't know if we can answer that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course, these are the most important things of the ark. Because what's it called? It's the ark of the covenant. And what is the covenant written on? The tablets, the two tablets. Um, of course, one thing I, I studied about the two tablets, right? It's always two tablets. Is, uh, you know, we, we talk about how the first of the commandments are kind of focused on how we behave toward God. And then the second ones are more about how we behave toward one another. And that those ones are written on the one and the other ones are written on the or it just was too long or something. But one thing that I've studied is, is that uh, this idea of having a covenant written like this is, was just a common thing in the day. And the way it would normally work, kind of like with the bank, right? You, you buy a home, you have a mortgage, and you, here's this big, thick thing you signed 50 times, and there's your copy, and then the bank holds a copy, right? But so God is sort of like the bank or the king, and we're you know the people of Israel are are the people buying the house, but they're both put together in in the box together because God is with the people. God doesn't need to go and have his copy somewhere else because he's dwelling with them. So that's that's one that's way I've heard that described. I thought that was interesting. Well, I think we're out of time. Seven forty-five. That's I think that's where we're supposed to stop. So. We will let Josh know. We'll pick up on 17 there next time. All right. All right. So a while back, maybe a month ago or maybe three weeks ago, I can't remember how far ago it was, but we had a big storm and lots of trees came down. Some people still have roadblocks and we, personally, in our family, we had our power out for eight days and our Wi-Fi out for ten days. So, uh, that got me thinking, because we had to go to the basement because of this big storm. When I was in the basement at 12 a.m., I was thinking, you know, I like making analogies. How could I turn this into an analogy for an invitation? So, what I came up with was, when the judgment days come, are we going to be like the trees who fall, or are we going to be prepared to stand firm? So, in Romans... 6 20, and verses 23. 
it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So are we going to take this free opportunity to be with Jesus in heaven, or are we going to choose death? In 2 Peter verses, or chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And then Mark chapter 13, verses 32 to 37, it says, But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for if you do not know when the time will come, it is like a man going on a journey, when he leaves and comes home and put his... When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight, like when the storm came for us, or when the rooster crows, or even in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. So when Jesus comes back, will we be awake? That's the main point that I'm drawing on right here. Will we be prepared to take hold of the free blessings that God gives us? And it's just like the parables that are in Matthew, the parable of the ten virgins, that's in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven, then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will be not enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So I think that I've established that from all this, we need to be prepared when Jesus comes. And how do we become prepared? Well, first of all, John 3.16 says, for God gave his only son that whoever believes in him might not die, but have eternal life with him in heaven. Sorry, I didn't really memorize that like all the other kids in Bible class. Uh, uh, but in Mark, verses 16, 16, it says, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So if you need to be baptized tonight, or if you're going through something and you need prayers of the congregation, please come forward as we stand and sing. <laughs>